Hello and welcome to lesson 19 of 20 in the URSA campus breakdown course on introductory statistics and probability. This is module 5, additional topics in inferential statistics, part 1, linear regression. Let's get started. In the previous module, we extended our scope of study by introducing the concepts of inferential statistics. And we examined in detail the processes involved in calculating confidence intervals and conducting hypothesis tests. This closing module of the course gives us a further introduction to several other useful inferential statistics methods, which can be used to make important decisions based on raw data from populations. The topics covered in this module include the following, linear regression, analysis of variance, or ANOVA, and contingency tables. This lesson focuses on one of the most effective and commonly used methods for deriving quantitative relationships between variables, linear regression. The topics covered in this lesson include two variable problems, scatter plots and the line of best fit through them, and correlation and hypothesis tests about significance of correlation. In this lesson, we look at the way in which two variables in a particular problem are related to each other. In other words, how one variable depends on the other or not. Examples of such problems include the following. For example, how does the number of hours per week spent doing homework relate to performance on an exam? Or, how does the number of beers consumed per week relate to performance on an exam? Or, how does the number of a person's birthday from 1 through 31 relate to performance on an exam? In situations like these, the two variables are linked via points of what are called points of observation. So for example, to address the question about how the number of hours per week spent doing homework relates to performance on an exam, we can do the following. We can define a random variable. We, we can say let x equal the number of hours per week spent doing homework and define a second random variable, let y equal the percentage, percentage grade on an exam. Now, each student therefore would represent a point x comma y corresponding to their homework and exam score values. So for example, a student who spends 12 hours per week on homework and then gets an exam score of 88% represents the point 12,88. If we collect a random sample of such students, they will comprise a set of XY ordered pairs or points which we can then plot against the set of x and y axes, which is called the xy plane. The result is what's called a scatter plot. And you can see the diagram at the top in the slide shows a typical scatter plot when we're comparing y equals exam score with x equals hours per week doing homework. And you can see each student is represented on the scatter plot by a single blue point. Here are a couple of other examples of scatter plots on the slide. So on the bottom, on the left, we have y equals exam score plotted against x equals number of beers consumed per week. And on the bottom right, we have y equals exam score plotted against x equals the day of birth between 1 and 31. While a scatter plot typically consists of a scatter of points that cannot all be joined by one line or curve, we can nonetheless try to determine what's called a line of best fit that best represents the overall linear relationship between X and Y. For the preceding scatter plots, the lines of best fit through them look like you see as follows. And you can see the three scatter plots with in red, the lines of best fit are shown in red going through the points. To determine the specific equation that represents a line of best fit, we can begin by recalling that a linear equation relating x and y can be written as follows. y equals a plus bx, where a is equal to the y-intercept, in other words, the value of y when x equals 0, and b equals the slope of the line, which equals the rise over the run, 
which equals the amount that y increases for every unit increase in x. The preceding scatter plots are shown again below on this slide with A and B shown. You see A is shown as the intercept on the y-axis and B is shown via the diagram, uh, the little green triangle, right angle triangle that shows, um, indicates the slope where you would have a run of one and a rise therefore of B. And notice that in the, the top graph we've got um, a B well if we talk about the a values we've got in, in in all of these cases we have all of the y intercepts or all of the a values are are greater than zero and in the top graph the the value for B is greater than zero so we have a positive slope in the middle graph we have B is let B is less than zero which means we have a negative slope positive slope means it's going up to the right and negative slope means it's going down to the right and vice versa and then we see the graph on the bottom has uh, a line of best fit that just sort of goes through um, the points horizontally so we have b equals zero which means that the slope is equal to zero the general form of the line of best fit called the linear regression equation is as follows we say y hat equals a plus bx, where again, a equals the y-intercept of the line and b equals the slope of the line. And we use the lowercase or small x and y in the equation. So, so small x equals any particular value of the independent variable big X, and y hat, which, has, which is a little y with the hat, is equal to the predicted value of big Y when big X equals little x. In other words, y hat equals the value for the random variable y that is predicted by the equation of the line of best fit when big X equals little x. To determine the actual line of best fit, we therefore need to find values for the two linear regression equation parameters a and b for y hat equals a plus bx. The method that is used is called the least squares method, and it's based upon minimizing the sum of the squares of the deviations of each observed y value from its corresponding y hat value on the line. The diagram below on the slide shows a line of best fit with the deviations indicated as purple lines extending either up or down from each data point to the line of best fit. Where a data point falls above the line, the deviation is positive, and where it falls below the, b below the line, the deviation is negative. Now, if we were to add up the deviations, the positive and the negatives would cancel each other out. But squaring each deviation makes these all positive, and the line of best fit is the one whereby the overall sum of the squares of these deviations is minimized. Given a set of x, y points from a data set, the formulas for a and b are as follows. Now, the derivation of these formulas is based upon using calculus, and the details are therefore left for further study beyond this course. But what you are responsible for in this course is being able to determine a and b as follows. Now, you see the formulas here. Now, the order for the formulas is important because we typically calculate b first, and after we get b, then we can figure out what a is. B is equal to N times the sum of all of the, for each point, the product of X and Y, minus the sum of the X values times the sum of the Y values, all over N times the sum of the squares of the X values, minus the sum of the X values all squared. And from there, we can calculate A as follows. A is equal to the sum of the y values over n minus b, which we would have just calculated, times the sum of the x values over n. In other words, a equals y bar minus b times x bar, where x bar and y bar are the mean values for x and y respectively. We now look at an example where the line of best fit is calculated. In example one, 
We have the following data for a statistics class showing for each student both the number of hours per week spent doing homework and their subsequent exam score. In part A, we're asked to determine the equation of the line of best fit relating x equals hours per week spent on homework and y equals exam score. And in part B, we are asked to use the calculated line of best fit to estimate the exam scores for students in this class who spend eight hours per week on their homework and 17 hours per week on their homework. To answer part A, in order to calculate A and B for the line of best fit, we take the data table that we're provided with and we augmented it. We augment it with columns for each student for x squared and xy. And as well, we then calculate totals for all of the columns, x, y, x squared, and xy. And we also calculate values for x bar and y bar. So using the formula for b and entering in the values that we get from the table, we get that b equals 10 times 8,201 minus 99 times 712 all over 10 times 1395 minus 99 squared, which works out to four significant digits to be 2.777. And we, we round this to four significant digits because we're going to be using this number in, in the next calculation of A. We're going to be multiplying B by the value of X bar. So doing this, we get that A equals 71.2 minus 2.777 times 9.9 which works out to 43.7. Now, the 43.7, that's our value for A. When we're working out values of Y hat, we're actually adding that to the values we get from B times X bar. So in this particular problem, we're gonna to want to round our final answers to the nearest percent. So the value for A will round to one extra decimal place, so one decimal place. So that's why we round this to 43.7. So we end up with a line of best fit equation that is, therefore, Y hat equals 43.7 plus 2.777 times X. In part B, we're asked to find values, predicted values for y hat when x is equal to, so in other words, we're, we're asked to find predicted values for y, which is what y hat is, at the x values of 8 and 17. So we, we simply substitute those values for x into our equation for y hat, which is the line of best fit equation. So y hat at 8 equals 43.7 plus 2.777 times 8. That works out to 65.9, which we round to the nearest percent to be a score of 66%. And then similarly for x equals 17, we get y hat at 17 equals 43.7 plus 2.777 times 17, which equals 90.9, which rounds to the nearest percent to 91%. Recall that a linear equation can be plotted if we know at least two points. In the case of a linear regression, we can always use the following two points. First, we have the y-intercept, which always equals 0, comma, a, and then the point x-bar, comma, y-bar, which is always on the line of best fit. In example two, an expanded data table from example one showing the calculation of y hat for each x value is shown below at left. And below at right is a graph of the resulting line of best fit with the above mentioned points of interest highlighted as well as the two points determined in example one, part B. While the line of best fit gives us a useful model for predicting how the dependent variable y changes with respect to the independent variable x, there are some important limitations to consider. First of all, validity outside the range of sample data is questionable. The line of best fit is calculated based on the sample data. So technically, it applies only within the overall range of x values in the data set. For example, here, x 
is between 0 and 20 inclusive in the preceding example. For x values below or above this range, we are relying upon what's called extrapolation. In other words, we are assuming that the same linear relationship exists between x and y, and this can be a questionable practice in many situations. Also, the regression equation, or line of best fit, is merely a mathematical equation calculated based on sample data. In other words, it ignores the real-world context of the application. So for legitimate values of x, it may return impossible values of y hat. For example, the y-intercept a can work out to be negative from the least squares calculation. In other words, when we put all the numbers in from the table that we generate, we can end up with a negative value of a. Even though y values, by definition, may not be negative or cannot be, it may be the case that they cannot be negative in the particular application we're looking at. For example, for y equals an exam score, the minimum possible score is usually zero. So a negative score has no real meaning. And you can see in the, in the diagram below what this would look like. We have a scatter plot of points. And when we determine the line of best fit, it just so happens uh, due to the mathematics of the of the line of best fit formulation that we end up with this value of a that's an impossible negative value. Likewise, the line of best fit may yield y hat values that are, are impossibly high. For example, we could get a y hat greater than 100, where in reality the maximum possible exam score might be 100 as it often is or usually is. And you see in the exam in the diagram below, the line of best fit drawn in red, if we extrapolate it beyond the actual scatter plot points, you can see how it since it has a, there's an, a positive slope that if we keep uh, extending, if we go out further along the x axis, there there comes a at some point you'll reach a value of x where the value of y is above 100. So that's implying that there's some amount of homework that one could do above which one could get above 100, which may, of course, be impossible if the maximum score is 100. So far, we have looked at how linear regression can be used to model a two-variable data set via a line of best fit, y hat equals a plus bx. And we've used the equation for this line to predict values of y for specific values of x. The next questions we seek to address are as follows. Is the linear relationship between x and y positive, negative, or non-existent? And how strong is the linear relationship? In other words, is, is the relationship actually non-linear instead of linear, or is it a linear relationship? Is the linear relationship significant enough? In other words, is the line of best fit valid for use? And finally, how much of the variation in one variable can be explained by the variation in the other variable? We first define what's called the covariance, which measures how two random variables vary in relation to each other. The formula for covariance between x and y is as follows, and we write it as covariance of x and y using the brackets and the comma, so covariance x comma y equals the sum, and then what we what we sum up is actually the product of the, the deviations for each particular point. We take the deviation of the x value, so that would be x minus x bar, and we multiply it by the deviation of the y value, which is y minus y bar. So we sum the product of the, we sum the products of those deviations for x and y, and then we divide that by n minus one. Now, in general, if the covariance of x and y is greater than zero, that means that x and y tend to move up or down together. On the other hand, if the covariance of x and y is less than zero, then x and y tend to move in opposite directions. In other words, as one goes up, the other one goes down and vice versa. 
And finally, if the covariance of x and y is equal to 0, then what that means is that x and y tend to move up or down independently of each other. In example 3, we're asked to calculate the covariance for the data set in example 1. So to answer this question, we first augment our data table from example 1 to include calculations for the deviations x minus x bar and y minus y bar, and then their product for each data part, in other words, for each uh, student, which is each point. So we have the augmented table shown on the slide here that has the means. First, we have the mean values at the bottom of the x and y columns, and that gives us x bar and y bar. And then the last three columns of the augmented table, first we have the value for each student of of x minus x bar and then y minus y bar and then the last column shows the product of those two and then we add those up at the bottom and we see we have 1152.2 so we put that into the formula for the covariance and we get a covariance for x and y to three significant digits equals to 128 now notice that the units of the covariance are equal to the product of the units of x and y x is in hours homework per week and y is percent exam score so our units here are equal to our final units are equal to hours of homework times percent exam score per week is one way of saying it so our final answer for the covariance rounded to three significant digits is 128 hours per homework times percent exam score divided by or over week or per week As units vary from one data set to another, a dimensionless measure is required if we're able to com if we're to be able to compare data sets. This is provided via what's called the sample correlation coefficient, which is which for which we use the symbol R. And that is a scaled version of the covariance. R is used to estimate what's called the population correlation coefficient, and the symbol for that is rho. The correlation coefficient is a number between plus and minus one. In other words, r is always greater or equal to minus one and less than or equal to one. And the meanings of, of the, the most critical values in that range are explained in the slide below with the diagrams. And the first one at the top, you see an R value of equal to plus one means that we have a perfect positive linear relationship, whereas R equals minus one means a perfect negative linear relationship. Notice in both cases of those top two diagrams that all of the points in the scatter plot actually fall exactly on the line of best fit. The only difference is when r is plus 1, it's an upward slope from left to right. And when r is negative 1, it's a downward slope from left to right. Finally, we have r equals 0. And if we have r equaling exactly 0, that means that there's no linear relationship at all. We now look at two different ways of calculating r. The first formula is r equals covariance of x and y over the product of the standard deviation of, a, of x and the standard deviation of y, so sx times sy. So in other words, that equals the sum of x minus x bar times y minus y bar all over n minus 1 times sx times sy. Now, this formula requires that the sample, the sample standard deviations need to be calculated for each of the data sets x and y values. So a more practical shortcut formula to use with raw data is as follows. R equals n times the sum of xy minus the sum of x times the sum of y all over the square root of n times the sum of x squared minus the sum of x all squared all that times n times the sum of y squared minus the sum of y all squared. In example four, we calculate the value for the correlation coefficient for the data in example one. Now you see in, in the table 
uh, the column for y squared we will we will for the first time need to use here because that forms part of the shortcut formula for r. So using that formula and with the numbers that we have uh, based on the raw data, we substitute those numbers in. We get 10 times 8,201 minus 99 times 712 all over the square root of 10 times 1395 minus 99 squared times 10 times 55,338 minus 712 squared. And when we work that all out, we get an answer rounded to three significant digits of 0 0.830. The square of the correlation coefficient is called the coefficient of determination, which is equal to r squared. Now, since r is between minus 1 and 1 inclusive. Therefore, r squared must be between 0 and 1 inclusive. And of course, if r is 0, then r squared will be 0. And if r is either plus or minus 1, then r squared will have its maximum value of 1. Now, r squared can be calculated by simply squaring the value of r if it is already being calculated. But another way of calculating r squared is via its own defining formula, which is as follows. r squared is equal to the sum of the differences, the squares of the deviations between y hat and y bar divided by the sum of the deviations, the square of the deviations of uh, which are y minus y bar. So in other words, the sum of y hat minus y bar squared divided by the sum of y minus y bar squared. That gives us, and another way of saying that is, it's the squared variation in y explained by the regression divided by the total squared variation in y. In example five, we calculate r squared for the data set in example one. In part A, we use the value of R calculated in example four, and in part B, we use the defining formula for R squared that we discussed in the previous slide. So to answer these questions, in part A, from example four, we have R. Now we're gonna use one extra, because we're gonna be using the value for R to calculate R squared, we're gonna carry one extra significant digit, so four significant digits. So we use R equals, 0.8301 and we square that so therefore r squared equals 0 0.689 to three significant digits in part b to answer the question to calculate r squared based on the defining formula for r squared we we further augment our table. We add additional columns for y hat minus y bar, and then a column for the square of those values. And similarly, we add uh, an, a column for the square of y minus y bar that we previously calculated. So we get r squared equaling the sum of the squares of y hat minus y bar over the sum of the squares of y minus y bar and that gives us 3199.722 divided by 4643.600, which gives us the same answer of 0 0.689 to three significant digits. Any sample of paired X and Y data is likely to yield an R value that is not equal to zero. Even if the actual population correlation rho equals zero, due to random sampling error. To determine whether or not the observed correlation provides significant evidence of actual correlation in the population, we can conduct the following hypothesis test. So the hypothesis test looks as follows. Our null hypothesis is that rho is equal to zero with the, alter with the alternative hypothesis being that rho is not equal to zero. So we're looking at a two-tailed test here. The test statistic is t, where t critical is equal to t for alpha over 2 and degrees freedom equal to n minus 2. So the, we, we, for a given level of confidence, we would, we would have an alpha value being 1 minus the level of confidence. And because it's two-tailed, we split that into two. So that's why we're using the t for alpha over 2 that we've seen before for two-tailed tests. 
And for this type of test, our degrees of freedom this time is actually n minus 2. Our t obtained is calculated from the sample data, and it equals r times the square root of n minus 2 over 1 minus r squared. Now, as with other such, such hypothesis tests, if the absolute value of our t obtained is greater than t critical, in other words, the positive t critical, or an, put another way, if our t obtained is either less than minus tc or greater than positive tc, we reject HO as we've done before. And also as before, if, if that's not the case, in other words, otherwise, which means if the absolute value of t obtained is less than or equal to our t critical, then we do not reject HO. So the decision rule basically works the same as before. And as with other hypothesis tests in general, the p-value method can alternatively be used to make decisions about whether or not there is significant evidence of correlation between the two variables. Example six. For the data in example one, we're asked to do the following. In part A, conduct a hypothesis test on the significance of correlation between hours per week doing homework and exam performance using the critical value method at level of confidence equals 95%. And then in part B, use the p-value method to answer the question from part A and comment on what the decision would be across various common values for level of confidence. So to answer this, we have for this type of hypothesis test, as mentioned uh, in the previous slide, we have H naught is that row equals zero and H A is that row is not equal to zero. It's a two tail test. So our T critical is equal to plus or minus the T for alpha over two and degrees freedom equals N minus two, which gives us plus or minus the T for one minus 0.95 over two and degrees freedom equals 10 minus two, which equals plus or minus T for 0 0.025 and eight, which rounds to plus or minus 2.306, which gives us the decision rule as shown in the diagram on the slide. We now calculate our T obtained, which equals R times the square root of N minus two over one minus R squared, which uh, rounds to 0 0.8301 times the root of 10 minus 2 over 1 minus 0 0.8301 squared, which gives us uh, uh, to three decimal places 4.211. So we compare that with our decision rule and we can see that we're in the right rejection region. So therefore we reject H naught. There is sufficient evidence at level of confidence equals 95% to conclude that rho is not equal to zero. And furthermore, uh, we can specify that it appears that rho is greater than zero. In other words, that there is a significant positive correlation between time spent doing homework and exam performance. In part B, we look in the degrees freedom equals eight row of the T table and we see that T our T obtained value of 4.211 falls between 3.833, which corresponds to P equals two times 0 0.0025, which equals 0 0.005, and 4.501, which corresponds to P equals two times 0 0.001 equals 0 0.002. So therefore, we can say that our P value is between 0 0.002 and 0 0.005. So what this means, therefore, is that our p-value will be less than common alpha values that are at 0 0.005 and larger, and we will, our p-value will be greater than alpha at common alpha values of 0 0.002 or smaller. So we reject H naught at common values of level of confidence from 99.5% and downwards, and we do not reject H naught at common levels of confidence from 99.8% and upwards. In other words, we would therefore conclude that there is a significant positive correlation between time spent on homework and exam performance at levels of confidence, at common levels of confidence from 99.5% and downwards, while we would conclude that there is no significant correlation between time spent on homework and exam performance 
at common levels of confidence that from 99.8% and upwards. I hope that you found this video helpful. If you liked it and would like to see more from MRSA Campus, then please subscribe. And also, if you'd like to send your feedback, that's always welcome too. Thanks for watching, and I wish you well with your studies.